business since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution is utterly and completely unsustainable. And my friend Maria, she read out these absolutely horrifying statistics about the number of children facing these harrowing environmental threats. We cannot, we cannot allow that to continue. And the, sometimes the statistics are abstract, but we have young people like Sahir here to put a human face on this. And I can only say in my short time that the right to a healthy environment has to be seen as a catalyst for systemic and transformative change in much the way that the rights to freedom and equality have served as catalysts for transformative change throughout the last hundreds of years of human history. The abolitionists who used human rights to achieve the end of slavery, the suffragettes who used human rights to advance the equality of women, the tremendous work by indigenous peoples to achieve the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, work by persons with disabilities, work by LGBTQ plus people. I mean, all of these social movements have used the power of human rights to achieve transformations in society. It's not easy, it's not fast, but it's one of the most powerful tools that we have. And in the face of a triple environmental crisis, climate disruption, biodiversity collapse, pervasive toxic pollution, we have to take this right and move it from the beautiful words of the UN Human Rights Council into actions on the ground that will protect, respect, and fulfill that right. And so that is a tool that we can now use, and we've already seen incredible changes just in the last months. We're seeing the right to a healthy environment be used to end the use of bee-killing neonicotinoid pesticides. We're seeing the right to a healthy environment be used to block offshore oil and gas development in Argentina in South Africa. We're seeing the right to a healthy environment be used to compel governments to improve air quality in Indonesia, in South Africa, in Chile, in Europe. And so, ah, oh, one minute to go, excellent. <laughs> Some people ask me, do these UN resolutions really make a difference? And the answer is categorically yes. Let me give you one tangible example. 12 years ago, the United Nations General Assembly and the Human Rights Council recognized for the first time the human rights to water and sanitation. Those resolutions were a catalyst for a cascade of constitutional changes in Costa Rica, in Mexico, in Slovenia, in Tunisia. And these constitutional changes then were implemented through legislation, policies, increased priorities. In countries like Colombia and France, they changed laws to recognize the right to water. And most importantly, the heart of this is that actions on the ground for people changed lives. In Mexico, they have extended safe drinking water to 1,000 rural communities in the last decade because of the UN resolution that triggered this change. In my country, Canada, we have a dark and shameful history of the oppression of indigenous people. But once the UN said the right to water is a human right, Canada, who previously opposed the recognition of that right, did a 180 degree, degree turn. And in the past seven years, I'm proud to say that my government has worked with more than 130 indigenous communities to bring safe drinking water and proper wastewater treatment to those people. For many of us in this room, we turn on the tap, we flush the toilet, we take it for granted. But clean air, safe water, healthy food, non-toxic environments, a safe climate and healthy ecosystems are the fundamental heart of human life on Earth. And so the right to a healthy environment is a powerful tool to help us achieve the just and sustainable future so that we can live in harmony with nature, which in our hearts is what we want to do. Thank you very much.